Hello, everyone, and welcome back to our for our I Know Humulus U 2022 event. Uh, I continue to be your host, Wayne Sheck. I'm the Senior Director of Product Strategy here at BSG. Uh, for those of you attending for the first time, Humulus U is a BSG's educational hop harvest experience, including not only today's webinar, but an entire month of events. Um, if you missed out on our other content throughout the month, no worries. Uh, you can stay tuned to our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash bsgcraft, where you'll be able to find recordings of all of our webinars from 2022, uh, as well as our presentations and webinars from previous years. Today, I'm super excited to close out our Humulus U webinar series with Dave Hall from Totally Natural Solutions. Uh, following the presentation, there will be a moderated Q&A, so please use the Q&A function at the bottom of the window to submit questions throughout the webinar. Again, super excited to have Dave here to introduce you all to the Hop Inspiration range of products soon to be distributed by BSG. Uh, Dave has been with Totally Natural Solutions for the past eight years, learning everything there is to know about innovative hop products, extract technique, and best practice for brew house introduction. He utilizes this knowledge combined with his 20 years of experience in the hop industry to support brewers in increasing their efficiency of their process without compromising on any of the sensory experience. So with that, I will welcome Dave and turn this over to him. Thank you, Wayne. That's a great introduction, and it's my pleasure to kind of uh, talk to you all about these great products. So I'll just now share my screen. So yeah, um, as I say, I'm going to take you through our natural hop extracts and how they can be used in the brew house. Um, you know, and let's get started. There we go. So a little bit about us. Uh, so totally natural solutions. We were established in 2013, so we're now in our 10th year of operation. Um, and that we're based in the United Kingdom in one of the historic hop regions, which is Kent. Um, part of our kind of unique proposition is we've got this patented fractionation technology. Um, and I'll go into that in a little bit later on. Um, we've got supply uh, around the world with our products through distribution partners like, uh, like BSG here. Um, and we've got a full kind of scale R&D team that are working constantly to look at you know, new and exciting hot products um, and different applications uh, and different bases, really. Um, we've got full analytical and sensory capability in-house. And, you know, we're growing. We're still growing. Um, year on year, we've been growing about 30 percent. So that's allowed us to continue to invest. Um, so we've just put in a brand new warehousing facility. Um, a sensory booth, and we're just putting a new production facility that's just about to start to break ground. Um, and then on the back of that, we will have some uh, some pilot brew kit as well, so uh, so we can really get to know some of these products. So it all starts with hops for us, um, and then we kind of break down what's in a hop, and the top kind of three there are the things we're really most interested in. So the alphas, the betas, and, the, and especially the hop oils. Um, for us, the hop oils are our, our kind of number one um, product. We, that's the thing we specialize in. Uh, a lot of the, the kind of traditional hop industry, you know, leans towards the alpha acid production. Hop oils are kind of a, a back end to that. We type, we've kind of flipped that model. The hop oils are our kind of speciality, and then the alpha and betas we still deal with, but they're not kind of our, our specialties. So in terms of hops and how they're used traditionally, you know, we all know they're kind of used the kettle, um, the whirlpool, can be the fermenter, or kind of dry hops later in kind of the maturation tank. So some of the challenges with brewing, um, hops are, you know, they're a natural product. You know, there's tons of variation, whether it be kind of crop years, regions that grown, you know, farm to farm, there can be differences. They can be prone to oxidation. Um, they definitely need to be cold stored and they can be a bulky product. So that you need lots of storage. Um, when you use hops in the brew house, you have to use all those hop components. You can't just, you know, use one thing independently. There are losses, considerable losses with, with highly dry hopped beers. 
um, you know, you've got capacity. So if you're dry hopping and that can take however many days it needs to, um, you can't move that beer on. Uh, so you, if it's high hopping rates, the cost in use um, can be phenomenal. There's a lot of waste to deal with. And definitely, we, again, with dry hopping, um, the phenomenon of hop creep, which, which can also present such a challenge. So we specialize in hop products, um, but we kind of know a little bit more, well, a little bit about all these, that not all of the hop products are created equal. Um, there were a lot of hop oil products that came out kind of in the 80s, um, you know, with varying kind of success on those sort of things. Things have moved on, technologies have moved on. There's different extraction methods now. You can use CO2, uh, steam or solvents. Um, you can start from different parts, you know, different starting materials, whether that's you start from the cones, the pellets, or even from extracts. And that can produce a, a variety of different final products, whether that's extracts, oils, solubilized products, emulsions, even um, kind of powdered products as well now. So in terms of us and what we do, our hop inspiration range is what we call it. So they are you know, tunable, clean label hop oil solutions. So what we intend to do is you know, give you the choice and the ability to adjust flavor, aroma, and bitterness independently. The products are all standardized, so they consistently deliver um, year on year. You know, every time you go back to a certain product, you will have the same experience. And these can be used strategically to, to help with some of those challenges, whether it be um, beer loss, you know, transport and storage, hop creep, anything like that. So the, this is the range that we have. Um, it can kind of come across as a bit of a laundry list, but we don't expect everyone to, to worry about what product is, is right. That's what we're here for. We're here to help kind of steer you in these, uh, you know, direction of what you'd need to know. Um, and I'll take you through basically the, the whole brewing process and what we'd suggest um, product-wise would be best to use. So in terms of use, we saw earlier the kind of traditional use. Um, for us, when we first started with these products, everything was kind of directed towards the bright beer tank and additions there. Um, as kind of time has moved on, um, and brewers have kind of got hold of these and, and like to kind of play, then adding them a little bit kind of closer to fermentation has started to occur. So you get some biotransformations and if it's added to the fermentation tank. Um, even at maturation, there's different kind of uh, qualities that can come across as well. And we also have some products that can go into to the hot side. So in terms of kettle additions, traditionally, for bittering, um, especially kind of early kettle additions. Um, not very kind of, uh, uh, sorry, the utilization is not great. Um, you know, it can only be sort of 25%. That's kind of getting better and better, I know, with, with newer techniques, but still relatively inefficient. Um, and then kind of on the right, you know, with the boiling time, so say with hops, there are more than one thing in there. So if you're trying to hold on some flavor or some aroma, if you're using those hops for bittering, all of those lovely uh, chemicals tend to be lost in the process. So we've got a, a range called the Hop Alpha range. So these are standardized bittering products. So these are either replacements or complements to, to bittering. Um, designed to be added post-fermentation. Um, and you will give you, because of the standardization, precise IBUs. And the utilization will be a, a hell of a lot higher. Um, so a very small amount will only be, need to be used compared to, to hops in the kettle. Um, we have naturally produced versions of, uh, of bittering products as well, as well as light stable and foam positive variants. So in terms of our products there, 
Um, we've got the, the standard suites but, uh, that are usually available on the market, as in ISO. Um, the row, which gives you some light stability. Um, then there's Tetra, which is light stable, but also starts to give you some phone positive uh, attributes. Hexa, again, is kind of a little bit more complex. Tetra can be a little bit kind of harsh on its bitterness. Um, whereas Hex is a little bit softer, but still you get that great kind of foam stability. But the bottom there is ours, what we call NISO, so our naturally isomerized uh, alpha acid product. So we've not used any uh, chemicals to catalyze the reaction. Um, it gives a kind of slightly cleaner bitterness than normal ISO, and it tends to be a little bit more sessionable. Um, so we're kind of really excited about that. Then on to kind of Lake Kettle or Whirlpool edition. So this is where we're trying to look for more kind of flavor addition rather than bitterness. Obviously using hops, there will be some bitterness kind of added through too. And this is where we've got one of our first kind of hot side edition products. So this is Hop Game Flow. This is relatively new for us. Um, so it's 100% hop. There's, there's no carrier or anything with it. Um, there's no alpha acids within this product, so it's light stable and there'll be no contribution to bitterness in the, in the whirlpool. Um, it's there to help kind of reduce trub um, and reduce some losses. The material itself, you know, it's, it's very flowable. It stays liquid at room temperature. And they're also varietal specific. So we've got a, a limited um, run of these at the moment in terms of varieties, so Citra and Nelson. Cascade, El Dorado and Sartes, but we are going to be adding more varieties um, soon, very, very soon. And then on to dry hopping. So this is kind of uh, one of the more popular um, parts of, of craft beer and in terms of adding, you know, unique flavors and aromas. Um, so for us, We've got kind of two products. The first of those is our hot burst products. So this is this is a whole oil varietal specific product um, designed to create those really kind of strong um, full oil aromas that, that can be found through dry hopping. Then we've also got hop shots. So these are a concentrated oil fraction where we've managed to remove uh, a lot of the terpene fraction and leave behind some of these really highly oxygenated compounds um, and esters and things like that, that can really showcase some of the, the, the amazing flavors and aromas of some of these hops. So in combination of the two, you can really kind of dial up the hop characteristic um, compared to dry hopping. And in terms of benefits, the solubility, you know, it's, it's fully soluble, so there's no waste. Um, a full kind of uh, replacement would see beer losses reduced by, you know, if there's, you know, beer losses of around 25% um, for highly hot or highly dry hot beers, this can then reduce that to zero with the, with the use of products. Um, it also gives you some shorter vessel occupancy. So these products only need a very small amount of time compared to dry hopping to, to solubilize within the beer um, and allows you know, that, that vessel to be used again relatively quickly. Critically, there's no, there's no haze addition with these products. There's no bitterness that's added with these products. Um, and through the, the extraction method that we use, you know, none of the enzymes kind of come through. So there's no you know, worry about hop creep. And then I kind of touched on the fractionation. So we've, we've got a patented uh, fractionation technology and that allows us to take kind of these, these whole oils from hops and as we term it kind of salami slice them into component parts. And this allows us to kind of isolate, you know, individual characteristics um, and use those as building blocks. So this can be either, you know, to remove you know, your hydrocarbons and things like that to, to allow all these other things to stand out 
or you, we can look into kind of some of the, the functionality within these hop oils. So we can tune varietal oils. So say we're dry hopping with, uh, with a hop burst, which is a whole oil. Um, and there's one part that's not quite right within that. We have that ability to take for the next kind of run, we can fractionate that oil, take out the part that's, uh, that's not quite right, put the rest back together and deliver a, a, a customized solution. We also allows us to replicate generic beer style flavors. So we can, we can put together an, a, a, a general IPA base or a lager base or something like that. Um, also with those building blocks, if there's times of limited availability um, or you know some really hard to get hold of hops, um, we can look at very sustainable hop varieties, use those with the building blocks, put them back together and build what we term as a type. And there are also these functional fractions that we found. So that kind of leads me into the next slide. So we've got a suite of products um, that can go into low and no alcohol. Um, there's four core products in those, which are the body, clarity, fruity, and dry. And these were all found when we fractionated. So there were certain fractions that didn't have so much aroma or, or flavor impact, but started to have these kind of functional uh, properties and when we put them into kind of low and no alcohol applications you know they just really stood out so it allows us to kind of build um, a stable beer base so there are challenges um, with making low and no alcohol beers uh, and hopefully within those four products one of those at least will will help so the benefits for those again solubility fully solubilized products they're suitable for any type of dealkalized beer base, um, and they're all 100% hop derived. So a little bit more on these, the body, again, it's, it does what it says. It's designed to add back that body, that mouthfeel um, that could be lost without any uh, uh, alcohol within the, within the beer. Uh, the dry is there to add a kind of dry astringency. Um, which will help kind of combat some of the resi any residual sweetness that might be left behind. Uh, the clarity is there that really cuts through that kind of warty note that, that can be available or can be seen in some dealkalized beers um, and just you know really suppress that. And then fruity, you know, it's kind of the, the exception to the rule when I say kind of aromas and flavors. This one, you know, we've we've naturally esterified um some hop fraction to put back these kind of esters and fruity notes um, that may not be you know, available in the beer. They tend to be more on the, the English ale kind of fruity character, so kind of red berries and things like that. In terms of their use, so again, you know, there's three examples there at the top. Um, there's, there's many more different ways, I, I know that, but uh, just for this, so step one, we'd always suggest get the bitterness in the right, uh, the right range, then start to think about balancing the taste and the mouthfeel by using the hop zero products. And then you can start to add the hop character, whether that's you know, with, with TNS products or whether it's just with hops. We also do a range that help with uh, fruits and botanical additions. So there's lots of kind of speciality beers, um, the use of all sorts of fruits and purees um, are seen kind of throughout craft beer. So we've got this range called the Hot Plus range. So these are where we've taken natural flavorings and hop, uh, hop oils, hop fractions, and created a synergy between the two. So we've got some popular products in that where we've got the, the tropical, uh, mango IPA and one of our newer products is the Hot Plus Blanc which gives kind of that that real kind of white wine um, you know muscat grape type flavor and again you know in terms of how they can help it's very easy very quick to create these specialty beers you don't have any prep worries and um, there's no waste 
and you haven't got to worry about anything kind of fermenting again with the, any fermentable sugars that may be added from a from a whole fruit, say. And then, you know, hazy beers, there's a very, very popular style. Um, there's some good ones we kind of like. So we looked into how we can help, you know, with these hazy beers. We understand that, um, you know, stability is one of the issues. You know, fresh beer is always great, but if you need to get it further afield, there can be challenges. So we've got this product, Hop Gain Haze. So again, all from hop, 100% hop derived, um, it creates a stable haze. Um, as a standardized product, it means that replication of, of your haze is, you know, you, you can reproduce it time and time and time again. Um, it's a completely natural production methods for this. So it's clean label, it's allergen free. Um, and we just kind of, we, we suggest that there's, there's you know, turbulent beer when it's added just to optimize the mixing. But the nice thing about this product is you can kind of start to rationalize your, uh, your grain bills. So you don't need so many adjuncts, wheats, oats, things like that. Um, you can start to reduce those. We understand there's kind of challenges sometimes um, in the mash tun. Um, when you're using kind of adjuncts like that. So to be able to rationalize that, keep a very simple uh, grain bill, but then introduce this massive amount of haze is, is such a good option. And then in terms of benefits, I mean, the, there's, there's loads. Um, I won't go through reading line for line, but uh, you know, they can help you know, with your brewing efficiency. Um, you know, Get those beer losses down the quality you know stability get that flavor stable uh brew on brew on brew gives you some flexibility so you can differentiate a single wort stream um can then be differentiated into many different routes by using hot products you can reduce your hot bill you know you don't have to go completely across into oils these things are designed to you know complement as well um, if you just want to reduce that hot bill a little bit, you can then top up those aromas and flavors with the hot products. And then there's, you know, um, some compliance bits with uh, pesticide residues, um, you know, reduce your nitrates, things like that. So I touched on it just earlier with the water stream differentiation. So again, you know, just a just a quick demonstration of how how easy it can be. You know, the same the same product, the same beer, but you could change that from an IPA, you know, to a British pale, to a to a citrus pale. It could be, you know, the, the sky's the limit with these sort of things. And then a little bit kind of on case studies. So there's two case studies here that I'll I'll kind of touch on. Um, that we did with a with a top 50 craft brewer over in the US. And the first one was a Pilsner type. And they were using four different hop varieties. Some were kind of difficult to get hold of. Um, and this was a core beer that had been scaled um, and you know, was, was contract brewed in a, in a commercial lager brewery. And that created a lot of challenges for the brewers. Um, it was a high dry, high dry hop bill. Um, and that allowed us to kind of look at, see what we could do to help. So when we, when we started, we looked at it with uh, sensory assessment and some speamy analysis here kind of in our labs. That allowed us to look into what hop components were most prevalent in the beer. Then we created some concepts to hopefully match those uh, dry hop products. We took those out back over and we trialed that on small scale. Um, then just kind of adjusted. Sometimes with these things, it's not the first time that these will hit, right? They need two, maybe three iterations to start to, to move in the right direction. And it, it's a little bit of back and forth and a little bit of work, but that's what we're here for. And that's our kind of speciality. Um, once that was taken, the, uh, the product was accepted. They were taken for kind of shelf life. 
what we kind of found was, you know, the initial beer flavor had improved. Um, it maintained its beer flavor for longer. And um, we also helped reduce costs. We definitely helped reduce beer losses and increase their capacities. And the kind of bottom line, when they looked at it, you know, with uh, with everything put together, they were, you know, realizing about $150,000 worth of uh, extra revenue just by switching over to products. So with that one, we then were given an IPA style beer to look at. This was a real kind of citrus bomb. Um, you know, a little bit more on the hop, a little bit more varieties as well. So quite a complex brew. Again, we took it through exactly the same process. You know, we looked at it through sensory, we looked at it through SPEMI, identified the correct TNS products. Um, then through a couple of iterations, you know, tweak those into, into the right window. Um, that allowed, you know, rather than five different hop varieties, a single hop product to be added um, with a complete flavor match. Um, it helped reduce hop inventories, beer losses. There was a considerable uh, increase. You know, we, we reduced that. Uh, the maturation again, vessel occupancy improved, and that was an even better um, realization on the bottom line of you know, two hundred eighty-five thousand dollars, which was which was fantastic. It was a great success. So that's all from me. Um, Thanks everyone for listening. It's been an absolute pleasure to take you all through these. And now, you know, I'd quite happily like to take your questions. Thanks, Dave. Uh, we've gotten quite a bit of good questions coming through, but I'll put out another plug to folks who are on there. Feel free to use the Q&A at the bottom of the screen to submit some more. Uh, and we'll get to as many of them as we can. So, uh, Dave, I will start at the top. Um, can you briefly explain the process for producing the NISO product? Well, yes and no. <laughs> Some of it's IP, as much but as you I can. Mean, it, it happens naturally in the kettle anyway. Um, it's just not very efficient. So we found a way to make that efficient um, and then isolate the, the isomerized alpha acids to produce you know, a, a standardized product. Very cool. How about this one here? Are any of the products organic or do you have any plans to make anything organic in the future? We're, we're not organic certified. Um, you know, we do use some organic uh, hops and things, but one of the things that's kind of, we've realized and can be rationalized is the, the usage of these products um, is very low. So that's probably one thing I didn't really touch on was the whole, uh, the, the usage so usually our, our window of, of um, dosing for these products is between 5 and 40 grams per hectolitre so very very small amount so it can be rationalized that because the addition rate is so low that uh, it, it can fall within the the window of uh, additives for the organic market sure. um, and also through the distillation method there's no um, pesticide or anything residues that, that do come through so it's completely pesticide free when it uh, turns into an oil. Awesome. Uh, how about this one? Uh, you're you have a lot of examples from large breweries. Do you have any experience or options or more info on uh, small size breweries and brew pubs and how to maximize on that scale? Oh absolutely. I mean um... You know, in terms of kind of brew pubs and things, again, going back to the the, the work stream differentiation. So you could you could produce a single work stream, divide that up into some some different tanks, um, and create new beers through uh, through just the use of you know two or three products really. Um, and these these products are used from every you know the whole market. So from home brewers. We've got customers that are home brewers all the way to the, the big global breweries uh, and the big brands that you kind of know. Um, so it's, it's, you know, available and able to be used throughout, you know, regardless of what scale of brewery you are. Awesome. Uh, how about shelf life? Question about what is the shelf life of these products? So shelf life is 
two years for the majority of our products. Um, obviously, with some of the aroma products, once you start to use them, uh, once that bottle's kind of cracked, we we reduce that to about three months. Um, what we say is, you know, the, the headspace is your enemy, um, especially for the aromatic products. So if you've got a litre, say, we, we, we supply, tend to supply in kind of one or five litre flasks. So if you use 200 or 300 mils of that and leave some headspace, the next time you go to open it, there'll be a fantastic smell of hops, but that's all the aromas escaping. And, and you know, you want those in your beer. Um, so yeah, it, as long as they're kind of used regularly, then the shelf life's fine. But so uh, yeah, two years for unopened, you know, three used within three months once it's been opened. Awesome. Uh, question here about contact time, which I think is an interesting one for your products. What's the contact time needed for things like this to take effect? So minimum would be a couple of hours. Um, but we kind of usually say, you know, if you're transferring the beer late in the day with the products going in at that sort of time, come back in in the morning and the, the products there are ready to go. It, it's mixed in enough that uh, it should all be fully solubilized. Awesome. Getting a lot of questions about uh, samples and availability and things <laughs> like that. So I'll take that one. That's that. Show <laughs> you guys. <laughs> Just so everybody knows, we're still working through the details of, of what kind of which products that we'll have to start at BSG, what those pack sizes will look like, what are the details of the items available. But stay tuned, uh, either stay in contact with your sales manager and they'll keep you up to speed or feel free to shoot a note to info at bsgcraft.com and we'll keep you up to speed. Um, but we are looking to have all of these products on board, samples ready to go by the end of the year. So hopefully within the next month or two, uh, we'll have samples and product ready to get out the door. Brilliant. Um, all right, uh, so many good questions. Thanks everybody. Uh, a little bit here about oxidation. How prone are these uh, to oxidation um, and why the increase in shelf life? A little bit more of that shelf life question. So, I mean, all oils, all hop oils are kind of prone to oxidation. Um, so all of our products are kind of packed in an oxygen-free environment just to make sure that uh, all of that freshness is, is preserved. Um, so again, you know, if, if you're looking to kind of extend, you've used some products and you're looking to extend that shelf life a little bit, then if you can, you know, reintroduce some nitrogen or maybe even some CO2 into that bottle um, just to help reduce that oxygen, then that's fine. But it's not, it's not something that happens very, very quickly. It's a very slow process. So, uh, you know, it's nothing to be too worried about. Awesome. Uh, I like this question too. Uh, uh, you mentioned fully soluble. Assuming that includes cold side, can you comment a little bit on hop creep and, and how this product uh, 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 improves upon hop creep potential? So there's no, there's no, none of the, the enzymatic um, material will come through with the hop oil. So you, you haven't got that, that whole hop kind of vegetation that's, that's being added. And again, you know, that can be, if you've got such a large hop bill, even just reducing that slightly to, you know, bring everything back into tolerance, you can then still have all that great punchy aroma and flavor, but just by using the products. Um, but yeah, in terms of our, our products, there's, there's none of those um, hop creep causing enzymes that, that come through with them. Awesome. Uh, during your presentation, you talked a bit about dosing into turbulent beer. Uh, mm -hmm. Does dosing in line or dosing into a bright tank and then recirculating be sufficient? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So in line is perfect. Um, if you can't dose in line, probably the best way is if you go into a bright before you transfer the beer, add the product that you need, transfer the beer on top, that turbulence is enough. But again, you know, there can be recirks. We've had customers that have gone dose products into kegs and then recirked through the keg. So yeah, they have lots of different ways. As long as there's a little bit of kind of movement of that beer, then the solubility um, is fine. And it just means that it's dispersed quite nice and uh, regularly. 
Awesome. Uh, pilot scale testing can be challenging when playing with these products. Can these products be diluted or do you have any other tips on dosing into small volumes of beer for benchtop testing? Well, benchtop testing, I mean, we do it, there's two ways. There's kind of very rough and ready where we will sit with glasses of beer and just with a small bottle and a dropper, you know, go one drop, two drops, three drops and find a, find a tolerance of, you know, the dose rates that we want. Um, if you need to go a little bit more kind of precise, then we recommend things like micro pipettes and just start to get really accurate with that dosing. Um, and we use those kind of regularly here. Um, when we dose, we dose usually into bottle, um, you know, a little 12 ounce bottle. We'll, we'll dose into that just to just to get a sense of, you know, these products and what's going on. Awesome. Um... Can you talk a bit more about the increased foam stability with Hop Alpha Hexa? Yeah, so with Hexa itself, I mean, it lends itself both the Tetra and the Hexa. The, the foam properties are slightly different between the two. So it's basically down to kind of bubble size. Um, Tetra tends to have a little bit larger kind of bubble size. So the foam's a little bit kind of um, you know, lighter. Um, with Hexa, the bubble size tends to be a little bit smaller, so it's a bit more of a creamy uh, style head to it. But uh, it's just down to the properties of the the, the product itself. It's uh, it just helps with that with that uh, foam creation and keeping it as stable as possible. So you get that lovely lacing kind of down the glass as you drink. Uh, similar question, just to maybe asking to elaborate a little bit more. Any more info on how the dry and hazy products work? Yeah, so the dry, um, it, it, again, it just helps combat sweetness. So it, it just, it really does add that. Um, I, always, I always think of when we try and use it, it's kind of the Asahi kind of dry lager that you get. You get that real kind of characteristic with that. Um, the hazy, that's, that's kind of one of the newer parts. So again, we found a... a part of a hop extract um, that will create haze within a within a very simple kind of beer matrix. Um, when you do start to add it to things with, with extra adjuncts, so with extra wheat or extra um, oats in there, it can start to over propagate and really kind of crash everything out a lot quicker than you'd like. So reducing those and adding this, a, you know, helps with that kind of side of things. But um, the stability is one of the great things about it. So I've, I've from our early concepts of this, I've got a product in bottle that's now, I think two years, um, completely stable. Um, there's very, very tiny, tiny, tiny little bit of um, material on the, on the bottom of the bottle, but uh, everything else, it, it still looks as, as milky as the day when I first put it through. You, you jumped ahead to the next question, which is how long does that haze last? Do you guys have a recommended time for how long it will last? Or really, you haven't seen it fall out at all? No, no, not on that one. I mean, we've done some trials. We've done some forced aging trials and things. So, you know, um, as we get literature out to you guys, we can share all that data. That's not a problem. But uh, yeah, in terms of compared to, to, uh, to other kind of haze you know, generating products, we, we tend to have a, a very good stability compared to those. Awesome. Um, dilution, can products be diluted before dosing? And if so, what type of solvent? Uh, you don't need to pre-dilute with these. So they're already in a, in a soluble carrier. Um, so they can just go straight in. So there's no need for any you know, extra, say, you know, ethanol or anything like that. Um, you know, small enough dosing that, uh, that it should be easy enough to handle. Awesome. That's all the questions that have come through so far. I might pause and see if there's a couple <laughs> stragglers that come through. Otherwise, appreciate the questions, everybody. This is always a fun little uh, uh, Q&A when we get a lot of stuff going. That's nice. And it, it helps touch on things that I've probably missed over that, <laughs> uh, that I should have talked about. So that's great. Yeah, brilliant. And I'm sure we'll have more opportunities to talk about these in the future. So uh, absolutely, no worries. All right. Well, with that, 
Um, I will uh, thank you again, Dave, um, and thank everybody for coming out. Um, like I kind of said earlier, if you have any questions, whether it has to do with availability sizes or samples, feel free to email us at info at BSG craft, uh, and we'll take care of you and make sure that that gets taken care of. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, this is the final webinar in our 2022 series. So thank I want to thank everyone for attending and a special shout out to those who have followed along all month long. Really appreciate that. Like I said, all of our past webinars along with this webinar and future ones can be found at youtube.com slash BSG craft. Announcements of future webinars and other great information can be found via our newsletter and our socials. So please make sure you're subscribed to our newsletter. Please make sure you're following us on social at BSG craft. And from all of us here, uh, thanks again. And I might not have an opportunity soon, but I look forward to talking to everybody about hops again in the future. Thanks, Dave, and thanks, everybody. Great stuff. Thank you very much.